Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's program, Rock Your Next CMS Review, Steps to Respond to an ADR Prevent Details. My name is Jenny, and I will be your facilitator for today's webinar. Our program will be 60 minutes in length. The first portion of the program is a presentation, followed by a question and answer session. Today's program is being recorded and can be viewed again via the on-demand version, which is provided free with every live program purchase. The person who registered for the event will receive notification of how to access it within two weeks of the program. Before we get started, I'd like to take a minute to review the web conference platform. First, to ensure that you can all see the content for the event, can, that you can see all of the content for the event, please maximize your event window. To also maximize your slide view, click on the scale button located in the upper right area of the window above the slides so that it shows as 100%. Second, please adjust your computer volume settings and make sure your PC speakers are at the correct volume. You can also adjust the volume by clicking on the up or down arrows by the speaker icon in the presenter pod located on the upper left side of your screen. Third, to submit a question, go to the chat pod located in the lower left corner of your screen. Type your question in the text box, then click the Send Message button. You may submit questions at any time during the presentation. However, please note that it is likely that your questions will not be answered until the Q&A portion of the program. Should you experience any technical difficulties, such as an inconsistent audio stream during today's program and need assistance, please type your inquiry into the chat pod or call our tech support line at 877-297-2901. Next, I would like to introduce our host for today's program, Kirsten Dyes. Kirsten is a content manager for Decision Health. She writes and edits articles on issues impacting the home health and private duty home care industries for a number of Decision Health publications. Now I would like to turn it over to you, Kirsten. Thank you, Jenny. Now I would like to introduce today's speaker. Annette Lee is a registered nurse practicing since 1990 with the majority of her, for her nursing experience in public health care and her master's in healthcare administration. After nearly a decade working for the intermediary, she began Provider Insights, Inc. Finally, before we get started, if you look on the left side of your event window, you will find a Handouts tab where you can find a copy of the speaker's slide presentation. Please feel free to print it for reference if you don't have a copy already. We have also included several tools and handouts, including an info sheet on what is PPE, a checklist for home health ADR, a worksheet for face-to-face, -face, a Q&A sheet for CMS PPE, a flow chart for certification compliance, and a certificate of attendance. With that, I would like to once again welcome Annette and turn it over to her to begin the presentation. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Kirsten. Well, thanks everybody for joining. As you can see, just at a glance with the materials Kirsten's went over, we have a lot of information to get through today. So we wanted to provide you with a lot of tools that were takeaways and you could reference back to, and hopefully you find them very uh, useful when we do have to respond to these requests for our information. So first off, I just want to give a layout of the land that there is a multitude of different folks that may be actually asking you to send in your documentation. For home health and hospice, we've all had to do this. It's not really a matter of if, but it's when. We're going to focus today on the max medical review. So whether you bill to CGS or NGS or Palmetto, the process is all the same. But there are other folks that are going to be requesting records from time to time, and that could include the CERT, which is that compre comprehensive air rate testing group, the supplemental review contractors. We know them in home health from our five face-to-face -face we did originally several years ago now. The RACs, the ZPICs, OIG, all of these folks could ask for records, but that's a little bit different than the MAC, your CGS, NGS, or Palmetto. The folks you bill to are going to be different because they're prepay. All the other contractors are what they call postpay audits. 
because the folks you build to are able to hold your claim and ask for the chart prior to paying you. The rest of these different auditors, they have to ask you after the fact because they don't have the ability to hold that claim. So let's just start off with what is an ADR. It actually stands for Additional Development Request. Uh, most of the time I hear different made up acronyms, some of them pretty entertaining, but this is the real meaning, additional development request, meaning they want to see additional information to develop this case before they pay it. That's the big thing. Now, those MACs who are requesting these records, most of the time are Claims just go through the system and pay, 99%. But a small percentage have to be suspended through this ADR process, and they ask us to send in the record. So what type of standards do they judge our documentation by? It's different than state survey, very, very different. Because from a survey perspective, they're looking only at the COPs, the conditions of participation. That's their main bar that they want to ensure we are reaching. They also will look at any additional regulations from your state or your agency policies, or of course if you're Joint Commission, ACHC, or CHAP, they're also going to look at those standards. But from the audit perspective, it's a whole different ballgame. They are judging us based on the standards that are laid out in the Medicare Benefit Policy Manual. And in Home Health, our chapter is Chapter 7. Every entity has a different chapter. So if you did have hospice, that would be Chapter 9. There also are some local coverage determinations that the different intermediaries can put together and ask you to abide by those rules also. And then lastly, we'll mention during the presentation today the rules that the MACs have to go by. They all have to go by this Program Integrity Manual. Whether you build to CGS, NGS, or Palmetto, they are all ensuring that they go by the rules that CMS lays out in that manual. So we'll touch on that too and how that works. So there's a whole process when they are deciding who is going to have an ADR. There's a whole process out there. And that's outlined, again, in that manual we just mentioned, and there's the URL. And there are three primary types of edits that you're going to see. And that could be the widespread or topic-driven edit. It could be a provider-specific, a patient-specific, Plus, of course, we know we've went through our face-to-face -face probes. They always have to let us know in advance if there's going to be topic-driven edits out there. Now, right now, Palmetto and NGS do not have any out there, but CGS does have a couple. We'll mention those here in a moment. So why do they have to look at some of our charts? Again, 99% just go through and pay. Why can't they just all do that? Well, they're supposed to look at what they call vulnerabilities, whether it is a provider-specific issue, because we stand out as a provider, or if it's a widespread topic that everybody's at risk for. Right now, of course, those widespread topics could be something like um, high, high therapy. So, it is going to be focused on those problem areas where they think there's risk for payment when they don't think we maybe deserve all that payment. So they're going to look at those charts. So with a widespread edit, it begins with data. Something stands out in the data. They test the waters by doing a 100 claim probe from everybody who bills to them. Not meaning that every one of us have to do 100 claims, thank goodness. But with all of the claims that are being submitted to them, of those, they'll just pull 100. And they'll look at those examples quarterly. So as I mentioned, NGS and Palmetto do not have any widespread edits. But CGS, if you built a CGS, there are a couple. The first one is 
hypertension as a primary diagnosis with greater than 120 days length of stay. So I just checked it again this morning just to make sure what was out there, and that's what's out there today, hypertension with a greater than 120 day length of stay. The other one was if providers didn't respond to their request for ADRs during the five claim probe, if we didn't respond, they're going to be doing widespread edits on all of us. So let's talk a little bit more how medical review is evolving. There used to be, the next step would be a targeted review edit. Well, they have renamed that, and they call it targeted probe and educate, provider-specific probes, meaning you as an agency have stood out, and they want to look further at just your agency. And during this process, it's supposed to be more educational, but they are looking at those of us that had issues like a high incidence of errors with our five claim, probe and educate. But probably we also stand out in data such as PEPPER. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. Let's look at the actual process. If you are selected for the targeted probe and educate, you will get a letter saying you've been selected and they want to look at 20 to 40 claims. During that time, you have the opportunity to actually interface with medical review. That's supposed to be the whole root of this new process. It's supposed to be more educational. If they find that we have issues, we're not what they call compliant, there's going to be education provided, and again, that can be during our 20 to 40 claims. And then they're supposed to not pick any more claims for 45 days because they're supposed to allow us time to make changes to our forms, to our process, whatever the issue was. And then again, we'll get probed again with 20 or 40 more claims. So it's not a set number. They turn on the edit, they allow it to gather claims here and there, and then they turn it off when we've met at least 20. So depending on our size, we can get 20 to 40. And again, it goes through the same whole process. Was there an improvement? If yes, then they'll discontinue this for 12 months. If no, they're going to do education, allow that 45-day lag time, and do another probe. After the third probe and educate, third round of 20 to 40, then it says they'll have to refer us to CMS for further possible action. So the hope, of course, is that, you know, best case scenario, they don't find a problem on the front end, and then we just get that edit turned off. But most of this will probably go through round one if we are selected. So we have that communication, that education, we change our processes, and hopefully they find improvement and again, we get turned off. The biggest thing for us to take a pause and think about is, are you an outlier? Because it is going to be determined by your data if you are an outlier if you are going to be selected for targeted probe and educate. So again, two factors are really coming together here. First off, did you have four or five claims denied in your last round of face-to-face -face probe and educate? So those five charts, how did you do? And it only matters how we did on the very first round of review. So if you're thinking, well, I had five denied, but then all but one were paid on appeal, unfortunately, they're not looking at the appeals. They're only looking at that first round. But then they're tying that together because there were a multitude of providers who had four errors or some even five errors. But they're looking then at those providers to see who stands out in the crowd as being different. They're looking at you as a risk if you are different when it comes to being an outlier when it, for our utilization. So of course we want to be an outlier when it comes to quality. But when it comes to utilization, we want to be in the nice, comfy middle because when they determine that we stand out 
in utilization, whether it is our rate of pay, our length of stay, um, or the other vulnerabilities that Pepper will show you, those are the ones that they're going to flag. So I want to give to you the address to look at. If you've not seen your Pepper report, please go out and look at that, pepperresources.org. When you get there, it will ask, are you the administrator, director, or compliance officer? If you're not, get that person, and let's get this report for you. You'll fill out a short form, then they will uh, send you uh, the Excel document that has your report in it. Now just food for thought, when you get there and you have to fill out this form, again it's under Home Health Agencies here, and then it will say Get My Pepper. Just go ahead and click on that. But when you are filling out that form, it will ask for something called a validation code. It tells you specifically on the UBO4 where to find that. So billing will have to get you that code. I'll just be frank. Half the time it works, half the time it doesn't. So I've become good friends with the gentleman that runs their help desk under Contact Us. And I just email him, tell him what I'm trying to do, and then he can get us the correct validation number. So don't spend a lot of time working trying to get that to work. Um, just send him a note and he will get that code for you so you can expedite your uh, report. So all of these reports are viewed in percentiles. So they basically line us all up from worst to best or from lowest to highest, and then they cut us apart into different chunks, into percentiles. You fall in the 100th percentile, you're at the very end of that line. If you file the 80 percentile, of course, there's only 20% of folks that are beyond you. So that's how they're going to be judging us, is looking at where is the 80 percentile mark. Here's an example. You will see this red line. That's the 80 percentile. You do not want to touch any of those red lines. The solid is the national. The dotted, or I'm sorry, I should say, the, yeah, the dotted is your state. And the dashed is what they call jurisdiction 80 percentile. That is whoever you build to, CGS, Palmetto, or uh, NGS. That's the one I'm going to pay the most close attention to because that's the data that's being reviewed by your Mac. And they're looking to see, did you have errors and did you stand up above the 80 percentile mark or at the 80 percentile mark for any of these topics? So quickly, let's just go through the topics. Oh, and I should mention, these blue bar graphs will be your data for the last three years. So this will be 2017, 16, 15 in the new reports that come out in July. Right now, there's 16, 15, and 14, of course. So what are you going to see? Down at the bottom of the Excel document, you'll see tabs for each of these. They're going to look at who has the highest case mix. They see that as a vulnerability because they want to know, why are you getting paid so much more than everybody else? They'll look at the average number of episodes. Again, length of stay is a vulnerability because why do our patients need to stay on longer? They'll look at episodes that have just five to six visits. So what do you think the vulnerability there is? You've got it. It's because this is just meeting that threshold for an episodic payment. So they're paying us for a whole 60 days, and we only had to provide five or six visits. High therapy. They count high therapy as being 20 or more therapy visits. So this, again, combination of all of the therapies involved, PT, OT, speech, and their assistance. If you have 20 or more in one episode, they, that's what this is going to count. Now that's going to happen from time to time. Uh, let's say it's a new CVA. I expect that. But if this is happening so often that you're in the top 20% of all agencies that provide this higher therapy, they may look at you. 
So this has been an issue that I've seen with some of my clients where we had an issue where they got a targeted probe and educate letter. They were selected to get the 20 to 40 claims due to the high therapy. They were over the 80 percentile and they had five errors on their probe and educate. So that's been an issue. High outlier payments, I don't expect most of us will see this, of course, because they already have things in place, like the 10% that we can only obtain in our outlier. So that isn't usually an issue. So knowing those factors that come from the PEPPER report, along with knowing where our errors were in that five claim review, are your two biggest tools when it comes to avoiding further review or being prepared for further review. So we've talked about widespread issues. We've talked about targeted probe and educate. And last but not least, the edit for patient-specific uh, claims data. If there's been a denial, let's say in part of your five claim face-to-face -face probe and educate, they denied one of these patients because they said we didn't have a proper face-to-face. -face. We were missing the visit note. They could turn on this beneficiary-specific edit that will run by that patient's Medicare number. And now every time you go to bill that patient, they are going to come up as an ADR. So you can expect that. Billing is able to decipher what these edits are. Be sure to always ask, because if there's ever one that they will tell you in the narrative what that's for, and they say it's a patient-specific or a beneficiary-specific edit, you know that this patient is being watched. Not that that's going to make me discharge them, but it's just nice to know this patient already is tagged, I need to make sure that my decisions are solid, my documentation shows it, uh, and expect that every time we bill, get ready to send in that chart. So who do ADRs impact at your agency? Well, obviously, since you're here, I expect you and everybody in our industry. And I hear things like, well, we've always done it this way and got paid. But remember that up until the time you have an ADR, they're not knowing what's in that chart. They're just paying based on the demographics and the billing information that goes in our claim. It is not a stamp of approval of the client or of the documentation, is it? So no news is not always good news. Once in a while when I ask folks, have you had your ADRs? And they say, no, I don't think we have had any ADRs. Sometimes I find out later that the biller wasn't watching for them. So ask them, what's their process? Are they looking every week for ADRs? Because once those hit, and they will, then we all are going to have uh, new duties added to our jobs. So that ADR process, important to know that once we submit that claim, the system begins the normal process, and if all of a sudden it matches the parameters on that edit, let's say it was for the edit that says hypertension as a primary diagnosis, and the patient's been on greater than two CERT periods, it may select this for an ADR. And if that happens because it met the parameters of that edit, then it's going to move it to this location, S for suspended, B, 6001. That's true no matter which intermediary you bill to. This is the location billers need to be looking for, S, B, 6001. And you'll see that there will be an ADR message that's generated, and it will tell them that we need to send in the chart. So we recommend this is on a weekly process, and you'll use, or the biller will use the inquiries menu, easy to do. They're just going to choose claim status, enter SB6001, hit enter, and up will come an entire line of anyone you have ADRs for. And if you use Ability or those other softwares, really easy because they'll keep you informed. So then our response is that we're going to have to gather the information 
Make sure there's some clinical oversight and looking at that. We'll attach a copy of claim page 7 to the top of the record. It has all the info that they're going to need. Uh, and then we need to make sure this gets sent off to the right place. Uh, I recommend by day 30 because there's a time frame that it's going to take to get there and get processed and get scanned in their system. And if it's not already scanned in and moved in their claim system prior to day 45, it will be an automated denial. So important to really pay attention to those time frames. And again, everybody's impacted. So we've included a checklist that really goes through about who's doing what, from billing to clinicians to administrative folks. So be sure to utilize that checklist. And then we'll have to determine, once we get an outcome from the MAC, what are we going to do differently? So compare the line item detail on claim page 2. That'll include your nursing visits, your therapy visits, your aid visits, and then you'll compare and contrast what was billed versus what they paid. So let's say it was a therapy down code. You will see some of those therapy visits have been moved to the non-bill side, and you'll see in the remarks section, and for clinicians on the phone, this is the biggest thing we need to take away, ask the biller for the remarks on claim page 4, because it's there that we'll get some insight to why didn't they pay it just as we billed it. And from that insight, we can develop some process improvement. We can determine, was it just our documentation that we need some further education? Was it a certification or some other technical denial that we need to just ensure we've got a good process around? And a QA process to ensure that we have all the pieces needed. Or did we just miss sending something in? And then we'll refine our actual ADR process and how we're gathering that information and how we're ensuring that everything is there. And of course, it's at that time that I'm going to determine, do I want to do a redetermination? Do I want to appeal this? Well, the top issues that they're finding for denials are these. Number one, due to the complexity and the moving target that face-to-face -face has been in the past, certification and face-to-face -face issues have been number one. Number two, medical necessity, and primarily of therapy. Now, why do you think there's a focus on this therapy? Well, because after five visits, the entire claim is going to be paid based on therapy. So a combination of any discipline up to five visits gets us an episode. But after five visits, any other visits except for therapy don't get any more payment. So they can't deny, even if they disagree with our last three nursing visits, they can't make denials on those things because it's an all or nothing episode or a lupa or nothing. But for therapy, if there is six through 20 visits, those additional visits are going to pay us more. So the reviewer is going to focus in just on therapy if there is six or more therapy visits total. So number one, it is an area of scrutiny because it is a driver in payment. So they're looking at it closer. And number two, it is coming to the top here because whenever I have therapy visits that seem to be repetitive, which that's the nature many times of therapies, is repetition. We know that if we go to the gym one time, that's not going to help us. We need repetition. But if it looks like we're doing the same things in the home, they will downcode our therapy saying we could have trained someone else to do that. So they're not going to pay a therapist to carry out what is just repetition needed in order to gain that additional strength. Number three is the 56900 denials, they call it. All this means is this is the code your biller will see, but it means we just didn't respond to our ADR in time. 
Next is the OASIS is missing uh, when they look in the repository. So if you have a validation report showing you submitted the Start a Care OASIS for a Start a Care claim, or the Research OASIS for a Research claim, send that. Send that. They should see it, but once in a while I see they don't. And then we have to send that validation in on appeal. And I'd rather just do it on the front end. And lastly, medical necessity of a nurse. So we'll talk about that here in just a moment. Meanwhile, I wanted to tell you that no matter who you bill to, whether again, NGS, CGS, or Palmetto, they all have on their websites these different tips for the different uh, reasons that there were denials and how to avoid those. So take advantage of those, and every intermediary also has someone you can talk to now for education. When your claim is in front of the reviewer, she or he is going to use this hierarchy. And they're going to start here at the bottom to ensure, did I have an OASIS submitted for this claim? Again, whichever OASIS is driving the HIPS code. Start a care for start a care claims. Research OASIS for research claims. And then they're going to look to see, do I have my face-to-face -face visit note? Do I have the certification of all those five things I need certified, homebound status, under a plan of care, face-to-face -face occurred on a specific date? And did I have orders for the visits provided? Then they'll move into the chart and they'll determine, does it look like the patient's homebound, at least for five visits? And did they need nursing or therapy, skilled nursing or therapy, and why? This is a key here. Is it reasonable and necessary? So if I just said the patient needs us because they have CHF, they would say, well, patients can have CHF for 30 years. Why did they need you now? So to answer the question, why home health, why now, is really supporting your medical necessity? Well, because that patient was hospitalized for their CHF and they had multiple med changes. So our medical necessity is that we're going to be assessing the patient to ensure the med changes worked and that they're not having any untoward effects. Now, if there are LCDs, and there are a few out there, Palmetto primarily has local coverage determinations, will also abide by those, and then, of course, the last thing they look at is OASIS encoding. So after they've went up the hierarchy and determined, yes, they're going to pay us an episode, then that's when they finally look to see, should they pay the episode at the rate we're requesting based on our OASIS? So what are those conditions? Again, defined by Chapter 7 of that Medicare Benefit Policy Manual, here's what we need to show why the patient needs us. We need to support that with that face-to-face. -face. They're under the care of a doc. They're homebound. They need skilled services. Why home health? Why now? And of course, lastly, if there's nursing, that has to be intermittent, meaning we know it's not daily, but it's at least every 90 days, and it needs to be less than 35 hours a week. So the certification has to include those five musts we've discussed, and it's easiest just to ensure that those are all on that plan of care form. So we've all used the 485 in the past. That's not mandated. But on that form that probably looks pretty similar, these certifications must be there. So that old way of doing things with this old certification statement on the 45 is not going to be adequate anymore because I need to have the information about the face-to-face and there needs to be the date here of that face-to-face -face visit. So let's talk a little bit more about this since it was the number one, um, it was the number one denial. In your handouts, you can look at this because I know it's too small to see on your screen, but it was provided in there in your handouts. There is that flow chart. So it says certification compliance flow chart.
So I created that just so we could really see what we need for the face-to-face. -face. So all those parameters regarding time frames of the face-to-face -face are in there. Um, so easy tool for you to use. But let's just talk about in the office, what does this mean? Your action plan. First off, there needs to be an assurance that we're all updated on the face-to-face. -face. And so we need to know that the face-to-face -face is a visit note. So if you obtain numerous visit notes, let's say they were in the hospital, they have numerous notes, choose your favorite one. Choose your favorite ones from a physician or an NP or a PA because that's going to be handed off to your plan of care physician. And then label it, face-to-face -face documentation. Easy way to handle that. When you write that certification statement on your plan of care now that the physician is certifying a face-to-face -face encounter occurred on a specific date, make sure that date matches now the date of the visit that you've selected. Those two must uh, be in unison. Those are the first two mandatory steps for the face-to-face. -face. So I better review my policies and make sure that I'm doing this correctly. I'm obtaining those visits. And review your forms. Delete those narratives forms. Physicians don't have to write narratives anymore, thank goodness. We can actually write those narratives, and we can include that on the certification or we can include it on a different form where we write it and the physician signs it. Those additional corroborating statements are included as part of the face-to-face -face documentation. So we also want to ensure that that information gets to the physician and documented again. It can be on the plan of care. It can be on another form. But that additional corroborating information does count as part of your face-to-face. -face. Once they get past face-to-face, -face, you're going to see that they're going to really be looking at the plan of care, the certification, the orders, as we've discussed. Big takeaways here, ensure that our orders were obtained prior to services, so that can be done verbally. Make sure that all signatures are either legible or there is a clear name written or typed on that form with credentials. And then it has to be signed and dated, and dated by the author, meaning the physician has to date their own signatures prior to billing the claim. And then when they move into homebound status, this is straight from the Social Security Act, and they updated the manual on that, that when they talk about homebound, these three things must be present. So just make sure your documentation supports that, that they need physical assistance or a device to leave the home, and they're not normally doing that. And when they do, it takes a lot of effort. I've, just for our um, ease, I've also copied and pasted some information straight from Chapter 7 about homebound for your trainings. The takeaway for staff will be that there needs to be both the taxing effort and that the patient is getting out infrequently, and when they do, it's infrequent and short, and then that equals homebound. Again, remembering that any medical absences do not affect the homebound status. So you'll describe those reasons that the patient has a taxing effort, as always, You'll look and see what are those limitations, what activity tolerance does the patient have, and ensure we document on both. On your worksheet that was provided for you, again, in your handouts, there is this worksheet, face-to-face -face worksheet it's called. This is just a nice cheat sheet for you when you're trying to come up with language that describes the patient's homebound status for you to provide to the physician so you can have that corroboration of the face-to-face, -face, here's what you can use if you, if you choose to, or something like it. Again, these were all keywords that we looked for or things we looked for that were patient-specific when I worked in medical review. So not only requires the assistance, but tell more detail about it. How many feet can they ambulate? Can they ambulate? Do they have poor balance? Is their gait unsteady? 
Do they have other issues like dementia? So again, that cheat sheet is free for you to use. And then the other uh, denial that we wanted to discuss that has been number one for years until Face to Face took it over, and I'm sure this will go back to being number one eventually across the nation, is why did the patient need us? So the number one denial for therapy, medical necessity, is that it became repetitive. The number one denial for nursing is we couldn't see why the patient really needed a nurse. So even though they have complex diagnoses, people live with these chronic progressive diseases for years. So we really need to spell out what's new. That's going to be the key. So they have a new diagnosis a recent exacerbation, new medications or treatments, they were recently hospitalized, describe what type of wound, they're on an antibiotic for an infection. All of those things can certainly help support the nursing need. And then, of course, these last three are for therapy. You will again find these on that supplemental handout labeled FT, FTF, Face-to-Face -face Worksheet. So again, feel free to use this when you're corroborating your story of the face-to-face. -face. The skills provided are also on that worksheet to spell out what's going to be done. Because remember, in the physician's visit, it doesn't need to even mention home health. It just needs to talk about why the patient has had some changes. It needs to support the medical necessity, but it doesn't need to mention home health or what we're doing. So we'll spell that out in more detail. So we really want to focus again on what's new or changed. What's new or changed. If there's progress or lack of progress, and if there's lack of progress, we should be seeing that we are changing our plans of care. So how does face-to-face -face fit in here? Again, remember that this is just a visit note. They help support medical necessity because the medical necessity happened prior to the patient coming to us. The changes happened prior to the patient being referred to home health. So during that visit by that physician or that non-physician practitioner, they should be discussing the increased symptoms of those diseases. They should discuss the new changes like the increased pain or the decreased function. And that assessing clinician then from your agency has the opportunity to provide more details to incorporate that into the face-to-face -face documentation. Again, this could just be on your plan of care. And when the physician signs it, it becomes part of the face-to-face. -face. CMS even talks about we could send the physician part of our OASIS. And if he or she signs it, it becomes part of the face-to-face. -face. So I think that seems a little more cumbersome. I think putting it right on that plan of care is an easy way to do it. But again, both are acceptable. I want to provide just some direct comments from Chapter 7 also regarding nursing and when would it be paid. They talk about assessment of the patient's conditions as reasonable and necessary, and they'll pay it as long as they can see that there's a need because there's been some sort of change. And that modification of the treatment, we're looking at did it work, and there might be more need for modification if it didn't work. And they say they'll pay this for three weeks. So if I had a patient who had an issue Let's say they were seen in the office by their physician, started on a couple new antihypertensives. We know open door. We've got at least three weeks to see that patient without any question. If we front load, that protects our payment as well as improves our outcomes. Because if Medicare says, we're going to pay you for three weeks, for this gentleman that was admitted when they were on a new anti, um, a hypoglycemic medication, if I just was paid for three weeks and I went one week nine, 
what's going to happen if this went under review? They're going to pay for three visits and not an episode. But if I front loaded and then I ended up discharging the patient early because they did great, I'm going to have five visits early on. So again, it ensures that I get my full payment, but also from a quality perspective, we know that front loading does decrease rehospitalization and it can improve outcomes. So lots of good reasons to do that. So we need to ensure that the chart tells a story. That's what they're looking for in medical review. They're looking at information from the medical history, which may include that face-to-face, -face, and they're going to look to see what's new, what's changed, what's complicating things, and that could justify assessment beyond that three-week window. And of course, if there's further changes, we can always warrant further assessment time, but we just need to document, document. Well, from Chapter 7, they mention these clinical indications, these sort of changes that may impact our ability to see a patient longer. So these are the things we need to chart. These are the things we need to have in our ADRs. When we send off that chart, we need to ensure that all those changes in the function need to be noted, all of those changes when it comes to vital signs, weight, edema, those need to be clearly documented in order to allow for that window to happen. But then, as with anything, there's an exception to the rule. When, of course, we have an exception, like the patient is seeing problems, those clinical indications we've mentioned, but it was part of a long-standing pattern, Medicare says we're not going to pay if it's just part of their norm or if there's no attempt to change a treatment. I know you've all seen patients where the blood sugars or the blood pressures have been elevated, and doc says, I'm not going to change anything. I think we've done what we can here with medications. The rest needs to be lifestyle changes. Well, if there's no further changes going on and the patient's not open to additional changes themselves that you've been teaching on, then it wouldn't be reasonable any longer and we would have to look at discharging also. Those are the sorts of folks that can get us in trouble with ADRs. So having that strong knowledge and grounding this in our documentation gives the clinician the best basis for decision making and then documentation. So understanding these rules from Chapter 7, not only is it just a good best practice, but it is going to save the day when it comes to your ADRs. Because Chapter 7 lays out when they'll pay for things and under what circumstances. So if I know those rules and I can document to that, it's going to show that yes, we have the right patient at the right time. So here's our takeaways for nursing. Assessment and teaching are totally payable by Medicare as long as I'm documenting. I'm going to do well on my ADRs for these. As long as I document that there's been this recent destabilization, not part of a normal pattern of just the little ups and downs that we see, let's say, with uh, PTI and R. Not just part of that pattern, but I've had some sort of outlier happen. And I'm going to show that by the patient's history, and I'm going to show what changes have been done and why it's important that I need to assess them and teach. And then again, those comorbidities may allow us some additional time. So I really need to ensure that when we get ADRs, this is documented. I want to see in those visit notes what's the primary reason for the visit. Sometimes when we're reviewing charts, I know you've seen it, sometimes we're unsure why are we even there. It looks like we just did vitals and some nice generic testing, or I'm sorry, not testing, teaching. So we need to ensure that we're really talking about what are we doing there. And of course, if this is a start of care, resumption of care, or research, that should really drive what's your primary diagnosis? Why does the patient need you? And then what are those other things that are putting us at high risk? And we want to avoid verbiage like routine nursing visit for symptoms assessment. I want to avoid that in my plan of care. I want to avoid that in my visit notes. 
And again, if we front load those services, that says to Medicare that this patient really needed you. You had to go more often. And again, we can certainly look towards discharge when that plan of care is effective. Unless I have an ongoing hands-on skill, those can be different, such as catheter changes, B12. I can keep those patients on indefinitely then. So let's talk about how to ensure that we are using the strongest documentation we can, even on those visit notes. On a visit note, I like to see a narrative, and I know everyone likes to just punch uh, and poke those buttons and those check marks, but we need to see some sort of narrative for the billable part of the visit. What's the patient's condition and what was our intervention for that? So it doesn't need to describe the patient sitting in their recliner and the cat's on their lap. I need to say that I assessed them for the exacerbation of their CHF. And the new medication appears to be working. The edema is decreased to 3 plus today from 4 plus yesterday or last week. So you get where we're going. Hone in on what are we doing there, first off. And then look back to my last visit and see, were there any other loose ends that I need to really look back to and, and ensure I loop around and cover? Was there a new med? Were there any new complaints? And this shows continuity and coordination of care, which is great for surveyors, but it also protects your payment that we're still actively working on things. And then, of course, any assessment of those other secondary diagnoses or risks are important also. And from a survey perspective, they want to see what did you really teach, not just teaching done, but what did you teach? Those are important uh, from a survey perspective, but it also, again, helps support your payment. From a therapy perspective, we know that they have to have those re-evaluations done by the professional therapist at least every 30 days. So they will look at that as a condition of payment. If they don't find it, they will deny from that 30th day onward for our additional therapy visits. But the key that I usually see being a problem on medical review is showing the ongoing skill. Certainly the assessment, the evaluation, takes the skills and education of that professional therapist. And updating their plan of care takes the skills of that professional therapist because they're assessing, they're updating. But we have to be very careful, and especially with our assistants, our PTAs and our CODAs, that things don't become just completely redundant. Because if it's something that it would be safe for an aide or a family member to carry out the same modalities over and over, they would request that we do that. They also, of course, have to have clear goals, and they do want to see short and long-term goals. Once they've went through all of that that we just went through in a whirlwind and they've determined they're going to pay us an episode, that's when they're going to then look at the OASIS. These are the factors that are included in our payment. So we don't need to re-document each one of these things. They will take it at face value. But if there's something contradictory so let's say that we talk about that there is, oh, let's say there's a stage one pressure ulcer. But somewhere else, we talk about it being a burn. Then they would question, it was the same site, they would question, is there really a pressure ulcer, especially if there's no further documentation. So be careful that things should mesh with our OASIS. They need to fit in the context of that medical record. All right. So in a whirlwind, that, uh, that wraps up the content for today. I'm going to pass it back to Kirsten so she can remind us how to enter our questions and answers. Thank you, Annette, for a very impressive and informative presentation. Because this brings us to the end of our presentation portion, we would now like to invite you to ask questions of our speaker. To submit a question, go to the chat pod located in the lower left corner of your screen. 
type your question in the text box, then click the Send Message button. Please note that your questions will remain anonymous and will not be viewable by other audience members. So to get us started, our first question is, say an agency is – hold on. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> say an agency is starting from scratch on the process for responding to ADRs. What is the very first thing that should be put in place? Ooh, such a good question because it really is um, it is a question of not if but when we have to do this. So I'm glad you're thinking ahead. We want to first off know that on the front end, the biller is looking for those requested records. So ensuring that that's being done on a weekly basis. And then building from there, we need to ensure that they can obtain for us the information that they're requesting. And then who in the office is going to gather the information? Most of us are electronic. So how is that going to be printed? Is there a way in your electronic system we can print the entire chart with just a keystroke, or do we have to go into each form? How is that done? After the information is gathered, then we need to ensure that there's clinical oversight. So knowing who's going to do that, who's going to be looking at that record, and the factors that need looked at. So in your supplemental um, documents that you've received, the ADR checklist really does take you through that process. The last piece that we hadn't mentioned yet today was after you feel confident you've got all the information needed, you'll want to look at perhaps putting together a little summary or a letter. And that summary, you don't want to spend hours and hours on it because the reviewer wants something quick to look at. So maybe in a bullet format, I'm going to outline those key factors that were in that hierarchy that we looked at together. Again, what do they need to see? The face-to-face -face visit note, the plan of care, those signatures, so those technical requirements, and then tell just a moment about what brought that patient to home health? Answer the question, why home health? Why now? Okay, great. And our next question is, what are some examples of things agencies may say they've always done but should really be avoided? Ooh, that's a good one. Well, a real life example I have was with an agency in Louisiana. And this could happen anywhere in the nation, but it was just happened to be there. And the agency had had patients on Medicare for on average a couple of years. And at the time when I met them, they didn't have an ADR issue. They said, well, we've always done it this way. And wouldn't you know, Soon enough, we started getting those edits, and they were getting denials right and left. And it seemed confusing to them because it seemed like they'd always been approved because they'd always been paid. So that was a hard lesson to know that just payment of my claims doesn't mean I've done it right, that we need a process in our own agency to ensure that we're staying up on the rules, understanding what we need for documentation, and again, be ready at any time whenever we're asked to send in a record so we know we can get paid for that. Okay, great. And how do we determine if it's worth it to submit a request for redetermination? Mm. That's a good question too. So first step, ask your biller for the remarks that are submitted by the reviewer at the MAC. So on the claim, page 4, they can see remarks. So it's not just the, the edit, or I should say the denial code. That doesn't tell you much. But the reviewer actually will type out why she or he didn't pay your bill. From that, I want to look at what they said versus what I'm seeing in the chart. And if you agree with them, if you think, oh, darn, yeah, that's right, we missed that 30-day reevaluation, I might not appeal that because there's really no way to go back and fix that unless I find it in my chart and it just didn't get sent. Then that's a whole other ballgame. So it really starts out with understanding what the denial was 
and comparing and contrasting what that denial feedback was with what do you see in your chart. And then you'll determine, do you have what you need? Should I send this back in and appeal it, or should I just let it go? All right, thank you, Annette. Unfortunately, we have run out of time for questions. In closing, we want you to know that your feedback is very important to us. Shortly, an evaluation link will, which we hope will be distributed to all who listened in your group. We would appreciate it if you would complete the evaluation at your earliest convenience. Now, I would like to offer Annette some time to provide her final thoughts. All right. Well, thanks again. And thank you, everybody. Again, it's not a question of if I'm going to get um, an ADR, but when. So the key takeaways would be be prepared with understanding your risks. Again, get your PEPPER report. Know your errors from your original five face-to-face. And utilize these documents, these supplemental tools, to ensure that you are able to check off all those factors that will be looked at when we do get an ADR. Thank you so much, Annette. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our program. Thank you again for joining us, and have a wonderful day.